to the motherfucking relay. We're covering today's top boxing news. Okay, we'll start with this. The ongoing barbs traded between Clarissa Shields and Keith Thurman. Shields warns Thurman to tread lightly. I'll fight him with both hands. She fancies her chances against Keith Thurman in a boxing match, perhaps not to stop him, but to outpoint him. Keith Thurman, on the other hand, is a lot more reserved. He believes that he could beat Shields using only one of his hands. I don't know what it is with these men. They have huge ego problems, not just in boxing, but in general life, Shields told the Mirror. She's one to talk about egos. Hers is out of control. And it has been for a while now, she continued. Keith said he could beat me with one hand and he could wear bigger gloves and I could wear headgear? I'm like, dude, stop. The guy walks around at 154 pounds. You're not that good of a boxer. You're not a world champ. Just tread lightly because I will get in there and I will fight him with both hands. Oh. Now she fought Hannah Gabriels with both hands and she couldn't stop Hannah Gabriels. Hannah Gabriels who was moving up in weight for that fight with Clarissa. Hannah Gabriels who had been stopped before. She got knocked out by Oxandia Castillo in just two rounds. When she fought Clarissa, however, when she fought Clarissa at a higher weight, Clarissa couldn't stop her. She fought Ivana Habazin at junior middleweight. Ivana Habazin who used to campaign as a welterweight. Ivana Habazin who was actually stopped by Michaela Lauren. When she fought Clarissa, Clarissa couldn't stop her. She couldn't knock her out. She fought Femke Hermans. Hermans. She fought Femke Hermans to a points decision. The same Femke Hermans who was brutally knocked out by Savannah Marshall. See, what I'm getting at here is, while Clarissa's not promising to deliver a knockout in a potential Keith Thurman fight, she's not. She ain't got enough power to knock the girls out in her divisions, much less the men. How do you plan on holding this guy back? I mean, what's really stopping him from walking through your shots, through your punches, when you can't even knock girls out? But you're gonna hold back a man? In 2023, Keith Thurman had been linked to fights with Jordanis Ugas, Errol Spence, and Amantis Stanionis. But none of them were close to happening. Shields is not holding her breath that a contest with Thurman will actually happen. He said he wanted to do it for charity, but who knows? Shields continued, All these guys talk, but when you throw the contracts at them and they get to mentioning money, these guys zip it. She fancies herself Billy Badass because she's targeting a fight with Keith Thurman. But if you're such a fucking badass, why don't you call out a middleweight? Why don't you call out Jermall Charlo, WBC champion? He's not busy with anything right now, and I don't think he has any aversion to fighting a girl. Didn't he knock one over at that diner? A waitress. Was it two years ago when he dined and dashed and skipped out on paying the bill? Why isn't she calling him out? Why Keith Thurman? Why him? She talks about ego. She talks about how guys having these huge egos inside and outside of the ring but check out the ego on her thinking she can fight a man a boxer like herself she's got one of the most insufferable personalities in the entire sport of boxing and that's saying a lot because there are a lot of personalities in the sport of boxing but hers really stands out as one of the more insufferable ones if keith thurman were to let loose and fight her the same way he'd fight a guy the same intensity he'd fight a guy the same ferocity he'd bring her down off that cloud Real fast. fast. Real fucking fast. fast. That's what I think. You see, there are applied sciences. There is technique and form and all those things. But there is also the physical. Even among men. Man. There are guys out there, because of their physicality, they may not be the best boxers. They may not have the best form or the best jab. Best footwork. Or the best fundamentals. But physically, they're strong enough to still overpower the other man. That applies here in a potential Thurman versus Shields fight in the sense that he would overpower her. She thinks that because he campaigns as a welterweight and walks around roughly at 154 pounds that she would have power and size over him. Yeah, maybe size. Not power. She ain't got no power. So what's gonna stop him from walking through your punches and letting him rip? Letting him go. Somebody ought to tell Clarissa that just because Keith doesn't take up as much space as she does, that doesn't make her stronger than he is because guys generally have more bone density than women do. I don't think she realizes that. Pounds of muscle as opposed to pounds of fat. There is also that to consider. You look at those meaty thighs she's got and a lot of that is lipids. It's not all muscle tissue. Most of that is actually fat, fat deposits. Not saying there's anything wrong with that. Everybody likes a meaty thigh, but essentially what I'm getting at is she fancies her chances against this fighter based on the perception of size and the perception of a size advantage, when in reality, I don't think she can take a clean, hard shot from Keith Thurman. No. I think he'd stop her. And if he did, they'd be calling him the bad guy for it, for a fight that she picked, for something 
that she started. She's got nothing to gain from playing Clarissa's game. He really doesn't. And the idea that she would have the gall to talk about someone else being egomaniacal, somebody else's ego being out of control. The nerve. Anybody that doesn't fall to their feet and grovel before her is accused of being a hater and accused of diminishing her accomplishments. He shouldn't entertain her. Been watching the sport of boxing for a long time, and I've seldom ever seen a fighter that's so accomplished yet so simultaneously disliked by so many like Clarissa Shields. It really is something. Them. Very disagreeable. Let's get it clear that Clarissa Shields isn't saying this stuff with any real aspirations of getting Keith Thurman in the ring. She knows that he likely won't entertain her, and what she hopes to do is publicly emasculate him. That's what she's really trying to do. She's trying to humiliate him. Why is the question, and the answer to it is relatively simple. She's a piece of shit. shit. She's got a piece of shit personality, and just because she's accomplished doesn't mean she's not an asshole. You can be great at what you do and still have the personality of a bear trap. Two things can be true at the same time. Clarissa Shields may be one of the best in her field, but she is by and large one of the most insufferable people in the sport of boxing. In other news, an interesting read by way of No Smoke Boxing, DAZN is in talks to buy a stake in ESPN. A bit of news that goes against the popular narrative that has been propagated here in the United States for the last three or four years or so since DAZN debuted in America. Disney is considering selling a minority stake in the 73 million subscriber ESPN, and DAZN looks to be one of the key players in the mix. Bob Iger, Disney CEO, revealed last month that the mass media company might consider selling a minority stake in ESPN or forming a strategic partnership with a company that could assist in inevitable streaming-first transition. ESPN subscriber numbers are declining year on year and the u.s giant which at one point commanded more than a hundred million subscribers is now down to 73 million this represents the inevitable transition from linear tv to a streaming first mode and espn as a result could now look to partner up with a streaming giant mark Kleiman in a city am column believes that former disowned chairman kevin mayer who is now an advisor to Iger, could be a helpful factor in striking a potential deal his own will face inevitable competition. Like I said, this goes against the popular narrative that some content creators here in America propagated about the zone the last couple of years since they debuted in America. They wanted you to believe that they were going to go under, that they were going to go bankrupt, that they would never be able to stage meaningful fights and significant fights here in America. In the United States and the exact opposite has happened. The zone has staged many big shows, meaningful shows, big shows right here in in the US of A, not exclusive to the US of A, because they cater to they cater to 200 markets globally. What could end up being their competition for a minority stake in ESPN may come in the form of Apple, Amazon, and Google, other giants that have been linked to an ESPN DTC partnership. Even if a deal cannot be reached to buy a percentage in ESPN, it is understood that an agreement which could see DAZN as a global distributor for 25 million subscribers ESPN. ESPN Plus is also on the cards. The Zone boasts about 60 million subscribers worldwide. 60 million. That's 60 million paying customers. Over the years, I've often highlighted the Zone's expanse globally, all these different territories that they cater to, and the Boo Birds persisted, not understanding that whether it's 60 million Here. wallets spread across the United States or 60 million wallets spread across the world, it's still 60 million wallets. That's still 60 million paying customers. These idiots don't want to understand that. Now, ESPN is the biggest sports network in the country, this country. But they, like the people at Showtime, are feeling the pinch. This is bigger than boxing, a bigger conversation than just what's happening in the sport, though it definitely affects the sport. The transition from linear to streaming. What's that all about? Well, the way people digest content these days, it is changing, and it's a lot more customized than it used to be in previous years. So many Americans cutting the cord, doing away with cable and channels they don't watch, channels they don't need, only focusing on what they actually take in. Which might be just a few subscriptions. It might be just a few platforms. You know, with cable, you got over a hundred channels or whatever it is, but maybe you only actually watch five of them. Maybe less. These days, you have the option to focus on just that five or just that four, maybe that three. Maybe you don't watch much TV at all these days. Maybe you spend more time on the internet. And this change is very much having ripples, 
waves. It's creating them. Because you're seeing industry giants, what once were industry giants like Showtime, like ESPN, feeling the pinch, declining viewership, declining subscribership. Everybody's trying to keep their head above water because everybody's feeling the pinch. What could a partnership between DAZN and ESPN look like? Well, because DAZN caters to 200 or over 200 markets around the world, perhaps what it might look like is, you know, content that you see in America by way of ESPN, you might see in some other country, some other market by way of DAZN. Get them an international audience, international revenue. Just bouncing ideas around because ESPN really focuses on an American audience, not a global one, not a global market, whereas DAZN... You're talking about 73 3 million subscribers for linear ESPN, another 25 million for the app, for the Plus, plus another 60 million worldwide by way of DAZN that caters to 200 or over 200 markets around the world. Could be beneficial. That's not set in stone. It's obviously not a done deal. It's just something that Bob Iger and the people at Disney slash ESPN are considering. DAZN would have to compete with some industry giants, with Amazon, with Apple. With Google. It's growing pains is what it is because things are changing. The way that the consumer consumes content these days. How many hours, how many exactly do they even spend watching TV? Do they spend more of that time on the internet? That's what it is in that entire conversation about Paramount potentially absorbing showtime and what content they're going to keep and what they're going to discard. This is the same conversation as that one. That's what it's all about. The transition from linear over to streaming. Streaming primarily because streaming is all the rage. So as it pertains to boxing and as it pertains to the DAZN platform, you see what I mean? That this goes against the popular narrative that some content creators here in America propped up when it comes to DAZN, that they were gonna go under, that they were gonna fail. They were broke. That's what these mouth breathers were saying, but here you have DAZN potentially buying stock in ESPN to become their global distributor. It's ESPN that's filling the pinch. DAZN is still expanding their catalog and still expanding their area of operations. So what does that tell you? Finally, in men's heavyweight news, Daniel Dubois, ahead of his fight with Oleksandr Yusik, says he's a cruiserweight. I've just got to land on his little head and bang him up. I saw Steve Bunce chime in on the fight, saying that Usyk is not a busy heavyweight. He's not a busy puncher. And I really don't know what the hell this guy's been watching. Usyk has more of a work rate than most heavyweights that are out there. Better cardio than most heavyweights that are out there. Daniel Dubois is banking on his power and size to overwhelm one of the quickest and most mobile of fighters in the heavyweight ranks. I feel like he's a mover, so we've got to cut down the ring, Dubois said of his strategy against Usyk. In an interview with pro boxing fans, he's a good mover, so that's the main thing, and just fight normally. He's a southpaw and all that, but you've got to fight. Punch, it's a punch, fight at the punch. end of the day, so just punch him in the face. His head's not going to be southpaw. His head's not going to be southpaw, is it? Yeah, opening up on him is the plan, Dubois continued. Opening up on him, being aggressive, everything that we've worked on in camp, just unleashing it on him. You can have the right plan. You can have the right strategy. Understand it without being able to execute it. It's easier said than done. It's easy to say that you have to overwhelm him with size, power, and volume activity. It's easy to say that, but it's another thing to actually do it when you're in the ring, under the hot lights, and the punches are being thrown, and you're being countered, and you're getting tired. It's easier said than done. Now, I've just got to land on his little head. Keep landing on his little head, bang him up. He's a cruiserweight. It's not complicated for me. It's boxing. I've done this my whole life. This is the right moment for me. I'm 25 now. I've been through wars, so I need to be a veteran in this fight. Some accused Anthony Joshua, at least in the first fight, of being too tentative and overthinking things, not throwing enough. That was in the first fight. In the second fight, he was more aggressive, more gung-ho, and had more success, but still came up short. Anthony's a more fundamentally sound fighter than Daniel Dubois. More athletic, more snap in his punches. More battle-tested against a higher caliber, a higher grade of fighter than anyone Daniel has fought, let alone anyone Daniel has beat. And he thinks it's as simple as just going in there, throwing punches and bunches, and wearing the little guy out. Oh, he's got the right idea that you don't want to overthink things. And you don't, because that will make you tentative, that will make you hesitant, though at the same time, what he's suggesting is a gross oversight 
oversimplification. He says you can't stand there and try to outbox Usyk. You've got to rough him up, which is true. But if it were easy to rough him up, then Derek would have did it. Yeah. Then Anthony would have did it. Yeah. I don't think that Daniel Dubois is as tough or as battle-tested as they are. No, he's not. I look at it, yeah. The first fight, AJ was a bit cautious, a bit too cautious for me to fight Usyk, Dubois said. And yeah, definitely, you've got to rough him up, haven't you? It's no secret. You can't stand there and try to outbox him or anything. You've got to rough him up. It is what it is. I don't want to think too hard about it and go over it and that stuff, but I do know what I've got to do. Can you do it, though? Both boys are weighed in, and it looks like Daniel Dubois, based on his weight, oh, he came in, lighter than usual, he's going for speed and shedding the excess. He'll be breaking in Don Charles as his new trainer for the very first time under the hot lights, having parted ways with Shane McGuigan. And given Don Charles's track record, he likely aspires to have Daniel fight the same kind of fight that Derek Chisora fought, Daniel not being Derek Chisora. He wants him to be aggressive, and he's got the right idea, though whether or not Daniel's built to do it is another matter. Having that experience there, Dubois said, and having a guy that has, you know, has been there, He's trained a fighter to do it, and he has a bit of a blueprint, but you know, it's him and me, and me and him. You know, all the higher powers at work. We're gonna go through him. Not keeping your head dead center, you're not. Daniel doesn't protect himself well. He doesn't move his head. He doesn't move it at all. He doesn't keep it off the line. And his guard, he can be caught. He's gonna be trying for shots and missing shots because Usyk is faster. Even if he is some years older and smaller, he's still quicker, lighter on his feet than Daniel Dubois with faster hands, quicker counters. Yeah. So Daniel's gonna try for shots that he's gonna miss yeah. and end up paying for it. Because his head is dead center. He wants to go in there, throw punches and bunches, throw the kitchen sink at the guy. Might end up missing a lot of those shots. You burn two times as much energy throwing a punch and missing as if you landed on something. Even if it's just the arms and gloves. You being the aggressor means you're gonna burn through your energy reserves faster than Usyk will just moving around. Not even counting what the counters do to him. Not even counting what getting hit with punches that he don't see. The effect that's gonna have. It's easy to critique how Anthony performed opposite the ring Oleksandr Usyk highlighting that he was tentative without high highlighting why he was tentative. That's the effect that counter punches have on a fighter. You get hit with something you don't see and it makes you weary. It makes you cautious. You don't want to get hit like that again. So look, I think Usyk is going to beat Daniel. I think he's going to stop him.